welcome to Liberty Live Church. We are so thankful that you're here. Yes. Super Bowl Sunday. Super Bowl Sunday. It's ready. Game time. This is an exciting day. <laughs> <laughs> I feel like we need some Super Bowl music. I feel like people are already getting their Super Bowl decorations up in their home. Decor? Decor. Is this a thing? <laughs> I think. Does anybody decorate for the Super Bowl? I I've never put done in the it. chat if you do, but I saw streamers, Super Bowl streamers this week at a store. Really? Yes. Hey, like little footballs and team colors. Absolutely. Okay, so we want to know where you're streaming from. Yes. Do you decorate for the Super Bowl? Yes, and also, partying. who are you rooting for tonight? Oh, big important question. Yes. Daniel, let's hear it. We didn't even introduce ourselves. I'm Daniel. <laughs> and I'm Jenny. Welcome. <laughs> Welcome to Liberty and Online. And what's your name? <laughs> yes, we would love to know. We and we do want you to get in the chat. But let us know who you're pulling for tonight. Yes. Because I personally, personally, I'm pulling for the Rams. Really? I feel like the Bengals is who I keep hearing about. The underdog. Okay, did you do that just to play like no, advocate? Okay. No, I've been asking around because I know nothing about NFL. Clearly, look at the shirts we're wearing. Uh, right, uh, we're sporting our uh, college teams today. So why yes. the Rams? Let's hear it. I don't have a great reason to be honest, other than saw them play the other night and I was entertained. Okay. And they're my team for okay. the Super Bowl. I will tell you one thing. I did find this out. Their coach is like 30 some years old. He's a young guy. Okay, I actually that saw. That appeals to me. I saw a video that the coaches have specific people that pull them back from the sidelines to uh -huh. make sure they're not in the way of the refs or on the field. Have you seen really? this? No, I've not seen this. Okay, this is my <laughs> extent of Super Bowl research, but um, it's going to be good either way. Yes. Well, clearly, we don't have a dog in this. Clearly, fight. we don't. We're we're going to eat. We are. What are, what are your plans? Plan partying with the group? I am, not really, but I will have a few people. Yeah. But um, I'm planning on snacking to no end. Okay. Is the snacking starting like at the pre-show? Or are we starting like at lunchtime and just keeping <laughs> it going? The snacking started this morning. <laughs> <laughs> For breakfast. Oh, cool. not really. Okay, favorite snack for the Super Bowl. Favorite Super Bowl snack. Mm. Mm. I'm going to have to go hot wings. Okay. Really hot. I don't eat them very often, but if I'm going to splurge, it's a hot wing. So I, I feel like wings are a Super Bowl staple. Mm -hmm. My personal favorite is cheese dip. Cheese dip. Yes. Oh, man. Pastor has a secret cheese dip recipe that he makes in the microwave that is excellent. Yeah. He puts cream and mushroom in it. Oh, cream and mushroom. <laughs> I guess it's not secret anymore. Uh, but it is actually good. That actually sounds like it would be really good. It really is. good. Has anybody ever made cheese dip with cream and mushroom? It's excellent. That's the first time I've I heard I recommend that. it. I will be having it tonight. Ooh, okay. Cheese dip. What is your favorite Super Bowl go-to snack? I love it. We got pizza out there. Yes. I heard Super Bowl is like a big pizza day. Wow, I will not be ordering pizza. Nope, nope. Uh, what else? Those little uh, beanie weenie things? <laughs> those are good. Beanie weenie. I like those. I genuinely like those. Those are good. Have you ever had them wrapped in bacon and then sprinkled with brown sugar? No, but that oh, seems like a win. Amazing. The sugar like crystallizes and you have like crystally crunchy <laughs> bacon over beanie weenie. Also don't eat those very often, but super good. So watching with a group, watching with friends. Speaking of groups. It's yes. time to get in one. If you're not already, 100%. you could have a Super Bowl party. We started our group semester this past week. We did, yeah. And a lot of you joined me on Monday night yes. for our online group. And Hashtag. I hope you got something out of it. Year, I would love to know what you're getting out of it. It's every Monday night, 6 p.m. Okay. And it's called New Year, New Me. And we're looking at spiritual disciplines. Okay. So our first week, we actually didn't look at one specific discipline. We really just looked at how to make room for God in your day-to-day -day life. Okay, so, that's good to know. Um, we laid some groundwork, and then tomorrow night, we're going to look at how to study the Word. Ooh, how to study the Word. So my question is this. We talked a little bit about, before we went live, like incorporating God in your day-to-day -day life. Yes. Practically speaking, crying babies, work responsibilities, meetings, <laughs> family drama, traffic <laughs> etc cetera, etc cetera. how what does this look like like how can we practically walk with god in everything that we're doing throughout the day yeah. how do we keep him involved well I, I i said this last monday and i really believe in using the natural rhythm of your life okay. rather than fighting against it and so 
I use the example of a young mom, but obviously having a baby right now, that's <laughs> where my mind's fresh at. fresh in your mind. Yes. <laughs> I am not a young mom, but I am a dad. Yes. Hey, that counts. <laughs> and, um, dad life. Hashtag dad life. <laughs> there is something about you can find the rhythm of your life to spend time with God and not fight against it. Mm -hmm. And so I had even, even read from one author talking about every time a baby cries, learning to pray immediately. That that was like a Ooh. signal to begin to pray. Yeah. But really doing communion with God, spending day-to-day -day time with Him, making room for Him to work in your life by using the rhythm of your life. If you have a long drive to work, use that. That's right. There you so, go. Uh, we're going to talk more about that tomorrow night, and okay. especially when it comes to reading the Word, because that's something you got to make room for specifically. Yeah. And so I think that's yeah. a big deal. Especially but. in a season with little littles, where you're basically at the mercy of their schedule. Absolutely. Like trying to sit down, if you're trying to have a quiet time at 5 <laughs> in the morning and you just woke up at 4.45 and you've been nursing or you've been rocking, it's hard to do. It is. You want to sit there and nod off or, you know. So... I like that idea, like working him into your day to day. Absolutely. Every time I want to throw my kids off of each other, you know, <laughs> Lord, you need to help me right now. Lord Absolutely. Jesus, come in this moment. Please yes. help me right now. So Absolutely. good practical. Tomorrow night, six o'clock. Yes. Hashtag new year, new me. YouTube, yep. Liberty Live dot online and Facebook. Y'all join us. And we have a great morning this morning. It's incredible. I'm telling you, I've been looking forward to this Sunday for so long. Yes. We're sticking with the football theme all day all day long and we have a special interview from mark rick uh, he was coach at miami coach at georgia you do not want to miss this service or this time of worship i really believe god has something specific with you in mind yeah and y'all be sure to go ahead and share this stream wherever you're watching get it out there to your friends tag them in the comments if you're on facebook they're not going to want to miss this so y'all get together get those chips and dip let's get ready for worship Hey, happy Super Bowl Sunday. We're so glad you came out and tuned in to worship with us today. It's going to be an awesome day of praise. So wherever you are, come on, clap your hands like this. Yeah, and we're going to lift up Jesus together.
Come on, let's lift it up. Woo! This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise you. This is what living looks like. This is what freedom feels like. This is what heaven sounds like. We praise you. We praise you. We'll see you break down every wall. We'll watch the giants fall.
our God so strong and mighty. I'm sure you guys came in fighting battles on your own, but I'm here to encourage you that we're going to echo what David said in Psalms 34, that I will bless the Lord at all times, and his praises will continually, 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 continually be in our mouths. So I want to encourage you that no matter what you're going through, that the correct and great response that you can have is worship to the King of Kings. He is the God who is fighting for you, and who cares? So come on, let's sing this out today. Come on, let's sing it. Yeah. Sing, I lift my hand in the battle. Set my eyes on your face. Come on, lift it up. deserves the praise this morning. Jesus deserves our praise. Come on, there's going to be a lot of shouting over football tonight. I said Jesus deserves our praise. I, I started getting concerned when I saw y'all coming in in all these, all these different jerseys, all these different teams. You know, I don't know that there's more uh, divided, a more divided group out there seeing all these jerseys right now. Y'all, y'all are rooting for a lot of different teams. I'm afraid to even ask who you're rooting for tonight. We might start division right here this morning. You know what I love? 
We come from all different backgrounds, all different walks of life, root for every kind of team you can imagine. And yet we find our unity in Jesus Christ and what he's done. And there, there's probably a lot of you here this morning. Maybe you're invited here. Maybe you came to hear Mark Rick. And there's a lot of you here this morning. You're like, I have no idea. Listen, I haven't been in church in 20 years. And, and I came in and y'all are shouting and hollering and got a football field in the lobby. And y'all are, y'all are crazy. Wearing your team jerseys. <laughs> Some of y'all maybe have never been to church. Maybe uh, this is your first time to Liberty. I want to be the first one to say to you this morning, welcome home. We really believe there's a place for you here. We believe this is the church for you. We believe you were meant to be here. And so I'm just glad you're here and you can take a breath. I'm serious. We, we don't take ourselves too seriously around here. And that's why we get dressed up on Super Bowl Sunday and, and we holler and we shout. And about the only thing we haven't planned on doing yet is, is you know, dumping a, a bucket of ice water on pastor. And by the end of this service, we might figure that out. If he gets too fired up. So we're going to have a good time this morning. We're, we're going to celebrate a Super Bowl tonight, so why not celebrate Jesus right now? And uh, if it is your first time, we'd love for you to fill out a red card. They're in the seat back in front of you. You can fill that out. Pastor's going to let you know what to do with it later on in the service, but we're just thankful that you've joined us this morning. I really believe no matter who you are, where you're from, God has a word for you this morning. He has a word for you. And so if it's okay, I want to pray for you right now. And and then we'll hear from Mark Rick together. God, we love you. We're thankful for you. And we just just come genuinely before you saying we need to hear from you today. I know there, there might be some reservation in people this morning. Maybe they're not used to church, haven't been here before. But God, I just pray you'd break down all those barriers. Just just help them be themselves this morning. And help them come genuinely before you. And I'm praying that you would speak to every single person here right now. We want to hear from you. So do what only you can do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You can be seated. I'm proud to introduce to you our new head football coach, Mark Rick. I tell you, it's Super Bowl Sunday, and our special guest today is Coach Mark Rick. Uh, I want you to know he's one of the winningest coaches in college football. Two national championships at Florida State, two SEC championships, five SEC East Division championships, voted twice Coach of the Year in the SEC, and then in the ACC, and then Walter Camp, Mr. Football himself, Coach of the Year. Come on, give it up for Mark Rick being here today. I want to welcome not only Coach Rick, but all of our campuses, those of you uh, who have joined us online. Uh, We had an incredible first hour, and I can't wait to see what God does this hour. So let me just say it's Super Bowl Sunday, and on the count of three, I want you to shout out who you're pulling for, who you want to win the Super Bowl. Are you ready? One, two, three. Rams. Washington and Dallas is not in the Super Bowl. I don't know. Uh, y'all got to get this figured out. But, uh, Coach, you have uh, some coaches and players in the Super Bowl tonight. So tell us about those guys. Well, all these guys I had the blessing to recruit and coach. And, of course, you start with the quarterback, Matthew Stafford. I had a chance to recruit him out of Dallas, Texas. Uh, quick thing on that recruitment, his mom and dad, I think, I think they went to Florida State. When I was there and uh, had a chance to, uh, he liked a lot of the quarterbacks I had coached, so that kind of helped. But the thing that really got him was his girlfriend, who was two years older than him, was already at Georgia. That'll do it every time. So that, that's how we got Matt. But, uh, but uh, no Sean Moreno, excuse me, I said no Sean Moreno. Sony Michelle, the running back, uh, recruited and coached Leonard Floyd, the defensive end, outside linebacker. Then Thomas Brown played running back for me, but he's the, running backs coach for the Rams and the, uh, I think, assistant head coach. Then a guy named Nick Jones played center for me at Georgia, and uh, he's a quality control coach there. So five former Bulldogs, so we got to be got to be cheering for the Rams. Absolutely. Well, um, you know, you're talking about those players. 
Uh, tell us a little bit about your playing days and then how you got into coaching. Right. Well, a lot of people know I coached, obviously, but not many people knew that I was a player, too. And uh, went to Boca Raton High School in Boca Raton, Florida. Was first team all state. I mean, I was a great football player. All you had to do is ask me <laughs> and, uh, or ask my mom. But uh, so anyway, I did get a chance to get recruited to the University of Miami, and not everybody knows this, but Coach Saban recruited me to Miami. And uh, people were, like, scratching their head on that one. But it was actually Lou Saban, not Nick Saban, who recruited me there. But I remember being in his office uh, just a couple weeks before signing date, looking in the Miami Herald. And I was a quarterback, as I mentioned, and I, he told me I was going to save the program. Miami back then, the U, was not the U uh, that it became five national championships in 20 years. The U was about to quit football when I went there. But Coach Saban said I was going to save the program, so I believed him. So, but I'm looking at the newspaper, and I said, hey, Coach, there's a guy named Mike Rodrique, quarterback slash defensive back from Choctahatchee High School. Tell, tell me about him. He said, ah, don't worry about him. He's a DB. You saw that slash. I was like, okay. I go, what about this guy? Jim Kelly, East Brady, Pennsylvania. Quarterback with no slash next to his name. And uh, he, I said, what's up with him? He looked me straight in the eye and said, Mark, somebody's got to back you up. <laughs> I, was like, I was like, good thinking, coach. But uh, anyway, I had my, I had my plan. Uh, I was going to start as a freshman, All-American my second year, win the Heisman my third year, be a first-round draft pick, leave after three seasons. So the only problem with that plan was, was that guy named Jim Kelly started living my life for me. <laughs> And uh, so, as it turned out, um, I started doing things I never dreamed I'd do. Uh, kind of a, let's just say I was an All-American candidate in the nighttime games. I won't go into too many details. But uh, I also had a little, had a summer school roommate who uh, was probably an Heisman, a Heisman Trophy candidate at the nighttime games. He was a guy looking for a fight, a uh, guy looking to get drunk just kind of a mess, and I was about going down the same road he was, thinking we were going to have one whale of a summer because we came, you know, he had different roommates in the summer. So anyway, he shows up after two weeks at home, a different guy. He, he, he has this piece about him that I just couldn't understand. I was like, John, what happened to you, man? He said, I found Jesus. I said, what are you talking about? And then he started showing, showing me some things in the scripture, and I'm like, Hey, this, may, this might be for me, you know. I got really attracted to him, especially as his, his newfound peace in life. And he was showing me the scriptures, and I'm th thinking this could be for me. But then I started thinking about it, and I'm like, man, what are my other roommates going to think about me if I do this? Or what's my girlfriend going to think? So I was more worried about what man thought than what God thought, which was pretty stupid. But I think we all do a little bit of that from time to time. Worry too much about what man thinks. Another thing was, uh, I was thinking, man, I don't want to be a hypocrite. If I become a Christian, i got to be perfect. I can never sin again. I started thinking about my sin. I'm thinking, I can stop this sin here and this sin I, I think I can stop. And I'm like, I'm not stopping this sin anytime soon. You know, so I'm like, Sur surely I'll just be this hypocrite. I can't, can't be a Christian. And the third reason why I didn't do it was I'm like, man, if I become a Christian, God's going to send me on a mission trip somewhere. I'll never come home. And uh, so I kind of put it off, so to speak. But uh, my buddy John Peasley planted some good seeds. And um, so I just kept on living life. Uh, didn't get a chance to play much behind Jim. But uh, I still held on to that dream of an NFL. So I waited for my senior year. I got my draft. Jim actually got hurt. I got to play half the season, something. I got a chance. Waiting for the draft. Draft comes and goes. Don't get drafted. My agent calls me, got good news and bad news. I go, well, what's the bad news? He goes, the bad news is you didn't get drafted. I'm like, duh, I know that. I go, what's the good news? He goes, two he goes you're a free agent now, and two teams are fighting for you to, to come into camp. I'm like, awesome, man. Show me the money. Tell me what's up. He goes, Pittsburgh Steelers want to give you six figures, six comma zero 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 point zero zero. I'm thinking, Wow. That's awesome. What about, tell me about Denver. He goes, eight comma zero, 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 point zero, zero. Six figures, baby. So I'm like, 
I'm taking the money. I'm going to Denver. So I go to Denver. I fly out there. The coach in charge of me has dinner. We sign the contract. And uh, I go back to my hotel room. He goes, hey, tomorrow when you get up, we're going to go see Coach Reeves, who's the head coach at Denver at the time. It's going to be a great day for you. I'm like, oh, awesome. So I go to the hotel room, turn on the TV, news flash. John Elway just got traded from the Baltimore Colts to the, uh, to the Denver Broncos. And I'm thinking, oh, my gosh. As much as I thought Jim Kelly was lucky, I'm going, lucky, lucky John Elway's coming to town. So uh, that morning, the next morning, I go to Denver, the, the facility. I meet John Elway <laughs> instead of the coach. And if, unfortunately, uh, the times that a rookie has a chance to show his stuff is during rookie camp. It's about a seven-day yeah, about seven days, maybe a week, excuse me, maybe, maybe 10 days at the most before the veterans show up. So I'm thinking that's my time to shine. Well, when Elway came as a rookie, he got all the reps. So I didn't get any reps other than this drill called the pass rush drill where they put, usually they put a dummy in there and a defensive end comes around the tackle and smacks the dummy and the dummy pops back up. With it. Well, they put me in there instead of the dummy. <laughs> and I, I could have got discouraged, you know, but uh, I'm like, I'm going to show them how good I am with my pocket movement. So anyway, about a week later, a guy knocks on my door at the, uh, at the college we were staying at. He says, hey, he says, pack your bags, get your playbook, and Coach Reeves wants to, wants to see you. So I'm thinking, now we're getting somewhere, baby. I'm going to meet with the head coach. We're going to talk some ball. I'm probably getting a new room. That's why they wanted me to pack up my stuff. Well, I didn't know when they said get your playbook and see the head coach. They're getting ready to cut you. Yeah, that's how I felt. So I went in there. I had no clue. I was so naive. I walk in there. He goes, he goes give me your playbook. I give, give, him, give him the playbook. And I literally thought we were going to talk some ball, right? And uh, he says, he proceeded to cut me. <laughs> and so I started crying like a baby. And he started crying a little bit. He felt so sad for me. I was so pitiful. But... Uh, Anyway, the, the, the guy in charge is like, hey, grab your bags. We got to go catch a flight. So I get on the elevator. I come down to the bottom. The doors open up. And right when I'm coming out, the veterans are coming in to just start camp. <laughs> it had to be a wide receiver because they always got something smart to say. He looked at me and saw all the snot bubbles and all that. And he's like, he's like dang, man, you got cut already? <laughs> and uh, So that was the end of my pro days, I thought. And so I had to find a job. I found a few jobs. Eventually got a job uh, valeting cars at the Boca Raton Hotel and Club. And uh, there'd be hundreds of cars at these events. And so you could, get, you could get money two ways. One is get your ticket, wait for a van to drive you out to the golf course and get a car and come back. Or you grab that ticket and sprint to the golf course, get the car and come back. You could do two, two times as many if you ran, right? So I started running, and after about a month or two, I'm thinking to myself, Dang, man, I'm in the best shape of my life. I think I need to go back and try pro football again. So I called my agent and said, look, man, I'm in the best shape of my life. I want another shot. I go, let's do it. He goes, he goes I don't want to represent you anymore. I said, why not? He goes, because you're costing me money. So my agent fired me, and I had a buddy. had a buddy want to be an agent. I said, you want to be an agent? I want to be a player. Let's, let's give it a shot. So by the grace of God, he set me up with the Denver Bron with the uh, Miami Dolphins. I'm in the locker room, I'll never forget, looking at the lockers, locker number seven, locker number eight, locker number nine, and there was my name, Rick. Unfortunately, they had Slash Del Greco, was, which wasn't real good, and it was like with that white athletic tape and a magic marker, but even so, I, I felt respect because that was my high school and college number, and I'm like, this is awesome. Well, just then, Bobby Monica, the equipment guy, walks in. He goes, hey, are you righted? I said, no, it's Rick. He said, whatever. <laughs> he goes, you're number nine, right? I go, yeah. He goes, you're going to get cut. I said, I'm going to get cut. I just got here. He goes, every quarterback that wears number nine gets cut. I'm like, yeah. I'm like, we'll see, bro. Well, then I start looking at locker 10, 11, 12, and locker 13. Who is that? Lucky Dan Marino. I'm like, I was the fourth best quarterback in the world at the time. Nobody knew it. About a month later, Don Shula was the head coach. Dave Shula was the quarterback's coach. We take a test on a Friday, on Monday. I go to the meeting. He goes, I got great news and bad news. 
I go, what's the great news? He said, you scored higher than anybody on the test. You beat out Don Strzok, Dan Marino, Jim Crash Jensen. You beat them all. He goes, I go, what's the bad news? He goes, you got to get your playbook and go see my dad. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, boy, here I go again. I shed a couple tears, and they sent me down the road. But after that, uh, got a job as a bartender, got fired as a bartender. They wanted me to clean the bar afterwards, so I'm like, surely I could do something besides this. So I tried coaching. Well, I, I sent a bunch of letters out, and of all places, LSU said I could come be their graduate assistant coach to help the quarterbacks coach. So I got my U-Haul packed. I'm going to Baton Rouge, and the night before I go, I get a phone call from the Bobby Bowden at Florida State. He wanted me to help him coach quarterbacks at Florida State. So I said, I'll do it. In year one, I won't go too far, Pastor, but you stop me. But year one, we had an open date uh, my first year there, and there was a, uh, a lot of – Coach Bowden said, y'all could go home for the weekend, but you got to be back for the team meeting on Sunday to get ready for class and, and football practice and all that. So a lot of guys went home, a lot of guys stayed in town, and there was a party on campus uh, that a lot of our players went to. And uh, one of our players, Pablo Lopez, got in a confrontation with the guy. Guy brought a shotgun back to the party and uh, basically just wanted to make Pablo back down like Pablo made, made him back down for riding through the lot too quick in his car with his buddies. And, uh, and so... Pablo approached the young man, uh, and the kid pulls the gun out, and Pablo kept walking and said, you're not going to shoot me, bro. Pablo had that, you know, he was, he was a Cuban kid from Miami. Miami Vice was the show at the time, and he had that bravado, and he just kept walking and said, you're not going to shoot me, bro, because of pride, and the kid pulled the trigger and shot and killed Pablo that night. You know, you, you've heard a lot about, um, uh, you know, when you got cut or when you got fired or when, you know, you went from one place to another. But in all of that, which would seem like loss, um, God was working all things together for good. Even this tragedy, yeah. uh, God worked for good. And we've got a clip that we want to show from that era, uh, some pictures. Uh, and I want you to watch this and then we'll dive back into the yes, story, sir. okay? I know you had a lot of success while you were there, but you also um, had some tough times, especially in your second season when you lost yeah. a player. Year two, um, Pablo Lopez, who's from Miami, uh, he got shot at the party and then um, the next day Coach Bowden had a team meeting and um, I was in the room as the graduate assistant coach and Coach Bowden basically said a lot of things, but he said, man, I don't know where Pablo is. I don't know where he'll spend eternity. And he, and he basically presented the gospel to the team and said, you know, God, you know, he sent his son Christ to die on the cross uh, to take on all the sins of mankind. And if we just choose him, um, then, you know, he'll, he'll pay the price for your sin, you know, and, and give you a new life. You become a new cre creation and all that kind of thing. So he's kind of going through the gospel with the guys. And then he said, um, he goes, man, Pablo used to sit in that seat right there. He goes, you guys are 18 to 22 years old. You think you're going to live forever, just like Pablo. And he said, if that was you last night instead of Pablo, do you know you would spend eternity? And so he's talking to the team, but I'm like, it's piercing me. And uh, I was like, I know where I'll go if it was me last night, you know. I go the next day and knock on the door, and he's like, hey, buddy, how you doing? And he calls you buddy when he's not sure your name is. And so anyway, I went in there and, and uh, prayed to receive Christ. And, uh, and then I just began to try to um, obey, just kind of love and obey God from that point on. It was truly, you know, really was a life-changing experience. My my old sin nature I was born with was eradicated through the blood of Christ and I did become the, the new creation that you read about in the New Testament. Praise God for that testimony, amen. amen. So Coach Bowden obviously meant a lot to you, influenced you. It was a defining moment in your life. Right. 
And, uh, and now you have influenced thousands and thousands, and uh, not many people make it in the NFL. So when these guys, you know, they get to the end of the road, what now? And uh, you've been like a father figure to them. In fact, he's too humble to tell you, but uh, when I picked him up at the airport yesterday, his phone was just blowing up with calls. And, and uh, on Father's Day, he says it's the busiest day of the year for his phone because of all these players who look to him like a father, and you look to Coach Bowden. And so, um, you know, just the importance of influencing and raising up men and women uh, who can change the world. Well, I had the the blessing of speaking at Coach Bowden's funeral, and the thing, my, my, my departing shot, basically, my parting shot was this. You know, when Coach Bowden went to heaven... God didn't ask him, how many national championships did you win? God asked him, what did you do with the young men I put under your authority? Hmm. And then good job, well done, good and faithful servant to coach. So I think that's what God God cares about the most. Amen. You know, coaching is a career where, um, you know, it's busy, time-consuming. You're practicing, watching film. It's game day. It's recruiting. It's dealing with the media, uh, and yet somehow you, you have a great marriage and relationship with your family. So how did you balance all that? Well, I know in marriage, uh, Catherine and I, we, we'd always think if this is me and this is Catherine and this is God, if we're, if we're both pursuing God, guess what? We end up in the same spot. We end up in a great spot together. And so, you know, I would just suggest that, you know, everybody within their marriage is not so much look to your spouse for your peace and your strength, but look, look to God. And when you both do that, you'll be like-minded at, when you get there. And uh, that, that's, what, that's what's really made our marriage great. Amen. And that's awesome. Um, you know, life is made up of seasons, and um, uh, God led you at some point to hang up your helmet and your headset, and now an analyst. And, and so, um, you know, after retirement, working out. I think you uh, had a heart attack. And, oh, yeah. and so t- talk to us about uh, finding purpose and peace and all the seasons of life. Well, I, I did uh, retire from coaching. And when I retired, I was, I was exhausted and exhaustion I'd never felt before, a fatigue I'd never felt before. And so we just decided to uh, move to the beach. We're going to live at the beach and live happily ever after. We had a little routine working out in the gym. And long story short, in the middle of my workout, I had a heart attack. And I end up in the ER and I end up on the table and the lights are bright in that operating room and I had two arteries 100% blocked, one being the widow maker. And they're working on me frantically and my eyes are closed, but there was a voice that kept asking me, what am I feeling? And eventually, you know, body part by party part, body part was starting to go numb and eventually uh, my head went numb and then the lights kind of went out. And it's kind of like a blackout. So I'm thinking this is it. I'm, I'm, I'm done. I'm this. I'm about to die, and um, but guess what? I felt. I felt that peace that my buddy John Peasley felt that summer. Uh, you know that that decision that I made for Christ in 1986 was real, and I never doubted it was real. But I, I, not only did I have peace, I had this excitement. I was going to see Jesus, and uh, and then all of a sudden that same voice said, "Wake up!" And I was like, "Is this Jesus or Satan?" <laughs> but it was a nurse. Uh, and so, uh, but anyway, after that point, I mean, I was so thankful. Not, not so much that God spared my life that day, but I was so thankful of the peace that I felt knowing where I was going and the excitement I felt. And just a disclaimer, if you've come close to death or you, if you come close to death and you're afraid of dying, I'm not saying you're not a believer by any stretch of the imagination, but... For me, it was, a, it was just a wonderful feeling to know I was excited about where I was going. Well, I know it's that same peace and presence of God that has seen you through now the diagnosis of Parkinson's disease. And so if you would take a moment, uh, tell us about you know, that announcement, that journey, and how right. we can pray for you now. Right. Well, you know, when I, when I had that exhaustion in Miami when I quit coaching, I was like, if I keep if I keep coaching, something bad is going to happen to me physically. And then when I had the heart attack, I thought it was a heart attack, but 
what had happened, what I, what I was worried about happening to me already happened to me. When you have, by the time you figure out you got Parkinson's, you probably had it five to ten years. So that exhaustion I was feeling had to do with that. But uh, long story short, uh, I was kind of trying to figure out how to handle it once I figured I had it. And uh, Parkinson basically, um, like right now I could do about anything I've done in the past that just takes me longer to do it. Bradykinesia means slow movement. It's probably one of the biggest t physical uh, side effects. But long story short, I finally decided, look, instead of, like I'd do an event like this and I'd be wallowing around and, Coach, you okay? You're back hurt? No, I'd be making up stories. And finally I said, I'm going to tell everybody what's up. So I did it on Twitter. And, and this is what I wrote. I said, I've been waddling around lately. People have asked me, what's wrong? Decided to tell everybody at the same time. I've been diagnosed with Parkinson's. Then I said, truthfully, I look at it as a momentary light affliction compared to the future glory in heaven. Thank you, Jesus, for promising us a future uh, blessing of a glorified body that has no sin and has no disease. And in the meantime, I'm going to enjoy the blessings I do have. So the point I'm making here is, you know, when I was on that operating table and I felt that awesome sense of peace because of God's word and what Jesus did, when I found out I had Parkinson's, all of a sudden I had this, this great sense of hope. You know, because my hope is not in temporal things. And, and I could read this scripture real quick. And, you know, this scripture I've probably heard a hundred times, but it comes to life sometimes when you have things happen to you in life. But 2 Corinthians 4, 17 and 18 says, For our, moment, our momentary light affliction is producing for us an eternal weight, of, eternal weight of glory far beyond comparison. For we look not at the things that are seen, but the things that are not seen. For the things that are seen are temporal, but the things that are not seen are eternal. So if I only look at the temporal, if I only look at what's going to happen here on the earth, you know, Parkinson's is going to swallow me up one day and I'll become a prisoner in my body. And that's it's not the greatest thing to look forward to. But if I look at eternal things and I look at that glorified body that's going to get united with my spirit and soul that was made perfect when I became a believer and, I, and all of a sudden... You know, I'm in heaven with this glorified body. That, that's my hope. So put your hope in things that are eternal and not so much things that are temporal. Amen. Amen. Well said, Coach. I want us to take a moment and pray for Coach. And uh, let's just bow together, every campus. Father, thank you for Coach Rick. Thank you for his consistent uh, Christian testimony, role model that he uh, continues to be for so many players, coaches, uh, Lord, I thank you that every door that you closed in his life was only to open a greater door, ultimately that defining moment when he said yes to Christ. And I thank you for allowing him to be with us on this Sunday. And I pray, just as you use Coach Bowden to win him to Christ, I pray that his coming to Hampton Roads, Virginia on Super Bowl Sunday will cause other people to trust Christ and be in heaven Give him strength. We pray for his health. I pray for him and Catherine, their family, their children, their grandchildren. I pray for his doctors. I pray that the uh, treatments that they're doing, that, that, Lord, you would use that to help him. But you're the one who created his body. You're Jehovah Rapha. And we pray for health and healing, that he will continue to be able to influence many more lives to put their trust in you. Now, Lord, I'm asking you to get him back home safely. I'm praying that he'll make this flight. I'm praying, Lord, that you'll go before him and that he'll be able to enjoy the Super Bowl tonight with his family. Bless him for his willingness to be with us today. And, Lord, I pray that, that you'll use it for your namesake and your glory. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. amen. Pastor, Absolutely. My, is my mic still on? I want to say one more thing, and I'm a, i am I got to get going. But uh, when I'm laying on that operating table, and I'm coming close to death, I, I realize, and I, I think I kind of knew it before, but it became real I, uh, obvious to me. There's only one thing that was important at that moment. You know, where, you, where was I going to go? When it all boils down, you're going to go somewhere, and you're going to spend eternity one place or another. 
And when I, when I had that peace in my heart that I was going to heaven, that was a difference maker. Amen. God bless. God bless you. Give it up to Coach Rick. Come on. He could be at the Super Bowl, but he chose to be in Hampton Roads, Virginia today. God bless you, Coach. We love you. Thank God for you. I'm going to ask you to be seated every campus and location. You know, one day, the game is going to be over. Right now, you can look on Monday and say, I wish I'd done this differently, or I wish I'd changed that play. But one day, when the clock counts down to zero, there's no going back. There's no changing anything at that point. And so on that day, the one decision that you will wish you have, had made is that you put your trust in Jesus. And right now, the devil's going to try to get you to make excuses. Everybody say excuses. The devil's going to come to you and say, listen, you're just as good as the people who go to church. And that may be true, but we don't compare ourselves to one another. We compare ourselves to a holy God, and only Jesus lived a perfect life. Another excuse, well, they're hypocrites in the church, and you heard Coach say that. That was one of the reasons he put it off. And I want you to, don't you think the pastor knows that there are hypocrites in the church? They're hypocrites in every walk of life. There are bad cooks and bad restaurants, but it doesn't keep me from eating. Can I have an amen? <laughs> Some people say, well, I'm going to wait. What are you waiting for? God to write another Bible? Jesus to come and die again on the cross? Some people say, well, I'm not worthy. That is the whole point. That's why Jesus came, lived a perfect life that you can't live, and he laid down that life for you. No one is worthy, only Jesus. You say, well, I can't live the Christian life. You remember Coach saying, hey, I won't be able to live a life and not sin again. Hear me. It's not about rules. It's about a relationship. On Judgment Day, Jesus will say to many, I never knew you. The word know is the same word where Adam knew Eve and she conceived and bore a child. God wants to know you, have a relationship with you intimately. It's not about rules. It's not about do's and don'ts. Right here, you say, I'm too busy. You're not too busy to go to work, go to school, go to a ball game. One day, you're not going to be too busy to die. Here it is. I have my own religion. Well, let me tell you the problem with that. It's not the Baptist way, the Methodist way, the Catholic way, or a religious way. Jesus said, I am the way. The truth and the life, no one comes to the Father but through Jesus. So your way won't cut it. You say, well, I'm not ready to join the church. I agree. You need to trust Jesus first. You say, well, I've tried but failed. You may have tried good works. You may have tried morality or religion, and that will fail you. But Jesus never fails. And then you say, well, I like my life the way it is. Maybe so, but will you like your life in 20 years, 40 years? You stay on this trajectory of where you're headed. Are you going to really like where you're going to end up? You know, Coach said, when Pablo died... And Coach Bowden said, what would you be if you had died? He said, I knew where I would be. I would not be in heaven. And so I want to encourage you, don't listen to those excuses. Let me tell you, one day you're going to watch your last Super Bowl. Tonight will be the last Super Bowl that some people watch. They will not live to the next Super Bowl. One day you're going to watch your last football game, basketball game, baseball game, hockey game. Uh, you're going to go on your last fishing trip or hunting trip. You're going to play your last round of golf. And the sun is going to set on your life. And all that will matter when that time comes, not whether or not you have a national championship, not whether or not you've been voted uh, coach of the year. The only thing that's going to matter is whether or not your name is in God's record book. Yeah, listen. Tomorrow's Valentine's Day. Guys, I'm trying to help you out. Are you listening? And everybody knows how this couple thing works. You know how it works? Someone makes a proposal. And someone says, yes. And on the cross, Jesus demonstrated his love for us. That while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And he has made the proposal. All you have to do is say yes. Romans 10, 13 says, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, it doesn't say everyone will be saved. 
No, only those who call on the name of the Lord. Only those who say yes. And so I want you to bow with me for prayer. Every campus, every location. It is the most important time in the service. Please don't move around. I want you to experience the defining moment like Coach Rick had. Right there with Coach Bowden. Just pray something like this in your heart. The words are not as important as it is the attitude of your heart. God looks at the heart. Just say, Dear Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. That you lived a perfect life that I cannot live. That you died on the cross to pay for my sins. That you were buried and on the third day rose from the dead. Forgive me. Save me. Give me assurance that when I die, heaven will be my home. Thank you, Jesus, for giving your life for me. Right now, I give my life to you. In Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen. Now, the Bible says, heaven rejoices. And I want us to do some rejoicing right now because of those who prayed that prayer. And I want you to find the red card. Everybody get your red card out. You getting the red card out will encourage somebody else to. So don't make them feel like the only one. Everybody grab a red card, all right? And let me tell you, we want you to put your name on it. We want you to tell us what decision you're making. But on the back, there's a box, box one. And if you prayed that prayer and meant it, I want you to write the word yes. Everybody say yes. If you said yes to Jesus, if you received his offer, his proposal, you're entering into a relationship with him. You're trusting in him plus nothing else to get you to heaven. Just write yes right there, box number one. And then, you remember I used the analogy that somebody makes a proposal and somebody says yes. Well, the sign of marriage is a wedding band, a wedding ring. And that lets everybody know I'm not ashamed to be the husband of Miss Tammy. It lets everybody know I'm not ashamed to be married to her. And baptism is the sign that you're not ashamed to be a follower of Jesus. And so in box number two, next Sunday, we're going to have a special baptismal service. And if you would like to follow in baptism or just want more information about it, write down baptize, all right? In box number two. If you're watching online, you can text yes in box one to 40371 or write the word baptize in box number two. Just text it to 40371. Have you got it? Box one, yes. Box two, baptize. And we want to help you take the next step. Are you glad you came to church today? Had it been an incredible time? So here's what I want us to do we are going to. Uh, stand and I'm going to pray and then after that we're going to sing a song a time for you just to reflect and the altar at every campus will be open and you feel the freedom to come and kneel and pray throughout the song if you're watching online make that very place an altar of prayer and I hope you won't be in a hurry today we, we have shortened the service giving you time to fellowship with one another in fact here's what I want you to do at every campus this is so important don't miss this once you have this filled out all right, yes, box one, baptize box two. There are tables with balloons out in the gathering area at every campus. Please take it by there and drop it off so we can make sure and follow through and get you the materials that you need. I know that someone's got to get to work or you're in a hurry, you're like coach, you've got to catch flight, you know. And so if you can't go by the table, just put it in the basket at one of the doors. Have you got it? Take it to a table with the balloons you don't have time and you're in a hurry, just drop it in the basket. All right? But he that believeth is not ashamed. And I believe that today's a defining moment. In fact, uh, I don't know how many books we have left. Uh, there were a limited number at our campuses. But the book is called Make the Call. All through life, you've got to make decisions, make a call. It doesn't matter what the fans think or what everybody else thinks. You, you're the leader. You've got to make a call. And it says right here, Game Day Wisdom for life's defining moments. And I promise you, for those who said yes to Jesus and those who want to be baptized, you will never regret that decision. Let's stand. Every campus, every location. Let me pray for you. And then we will sing and the altar will be open.
Father, I thank you for this day, Super Bowl Sunday. Thank you for all the coaches and teams that have come. I pray that you would bless them, help these coaches uh, to raise up uh, players that, that are not just great athletes, but I, I pray that they'll grow up to be uh, great husbands and fathers, that they'll make a difference in the world. I pray for these students, this next generation, that they'll know Jesus, that they'll change our communities, that they'll change the world for Christ. I pray for every one of our members, wherever they are in the workplace, to be like Coach Rick, that, that Coach Rick was a, a role model, that he was not ashamed of his, his faith, that he was bold in his witness. Help us never to be ashamed at the workplace to live out the Christian life. And Lord, I pray as people come and kneel in this altar and pray that you'll hear and answer their prayers. Uh, there are people who, uh, Lord, they're going through health challenges and relationship challenges and financial challenges and whatever it is, I thank you that our God is big enough to handle it and that you'll give them that same peace that only comes from your presence, that you'll see them through this. We pray it in Jesus' holy name and everyone say it. Amen.
enjoyed that testimony from Mark Richt. If today is the first time that you've heard about Jesus, the gospel, and maybe taking your next step of faith, and you want to learn more about how to do that, please let us know. You can visit us online at libertylive.church forward slash connect, or if you've got your phone on you, maybe you're watching on YouTube, just pull out your camera, scan that QR code on the screen. We've got staff here that want to pray with you, that want to help you take your next step, maybe answer any questions you might have. So please don't hesitate to let us know how we can do that. Following Jesus is one of the most exciting things, is the most exciting thing you'll do in your whole life. And on this Super Bowl Sunday, what an incredible decision that would be to make. Don't forget tomorrow night at six o'clock, Daniel Etheridge is gonna continue the hashtag New Year, New Me series. So join us again right here on libertylive.online, on Facebook or YouTube. And then we hope to see you again next Sunday at nine or 10.45 a.m. Y'all enjoy this Sunday Super Bowl and we will see you soon.